we do with every one of our featured speakers. We like to hear a little bit of, you know, personal side of Natalie that we cannot uh, otherwise find on the web. Okay, well, thank you so much, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to be from another part of the colder climates that we have, but I must say when I was traveling here, I was looking forward to a little bit warmer weather, so I wore the wrong shoes. But as a woman, of course, why would I be the only one saying that, right? Anyhow, to, to John's question, when, when I heard that as our introduction earlier today, of course, the first thing that jumps into mind, and in fact, I think it leads into this conversation we're going to have, is um, I thought about my sons. I have two giant sons. I'm the small one in the family. And um, one has become, left his corporate finance uh, job to become an entrepreneur. And uh, my other son is playing baseball in college in the U.S. And so both of them very much, as our family has been, very focused on health. And um, I look at them as products of some of the values that we bring up. And I think it's got a lot to do with the day-to-day -day life that we lead. Um, and health is a big thing for me. It's a high, it's a high value. Um, so it's got a lot to do with why I chose the career that I've had. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. But um, what, what I've been asked to talk about is the role of women uh, as it relates to entrepreneurship. And um, this obviously is a topic that has come up um, quite a bit. The whole notion of diversity, what does this mean? How do we feel about it? Um, I don't think you can really pick up a trade journal or the paper or something where it's not talking about some of the questions that we're asking ourselves even today. And so what I thought I would do is tell you a little bit of a story as it relates to um, how my path has developed, um, starting with some thoughts about, you know, some of the facts, because they are pretty shocking. And it's something that we need to pay attention to um, because we're not doing it enough. But I think it's also true to say that while that might be daunting, um, there are things that we need to do and should be doing. Um, and I guess my own personal value related to this is, I don't like to think about this as a gender issue. It's more, in my mind, uh, a thought of balance. And how do we bring the best skills together, regardless of, of um, where we all come from, but certainly speaking in mind about male and female. And, and as it connects to my career as an entrepreneur, um, how has this affected me and the choices that I've made, uh, particularly around people and what am I working on today to talk about it. So just to start off, um, this and obviously just by the way I've introduced this, it's you're going to have a sense of what I'm going to say, but um, this, to me this is quite remarkable because if you think about these companies, uh, Google, Twitter, Facebook, they're seen as, especially from an HR point of view, as very high thinking, forward thinking, uh, thinking a lot about attracting and, and retaining uh, individuals. But this represents a number of males um, employed in these companies. And if you look at that, it's, it's a pretty shocking number, set of numbers. So that's why we have to keep thinking about it, that's why we have to talk about it, but we have to do it in what we hope is a um, useful way that we can all learn from. Um, because it is true that our record, and I'll talk about some of the stats, particularly in Canada, but it certainly translates to other parts of the world, uh, we have a really shocking reality in our, in, our, um, in our record. And it's not just about fighting for salary. It's so much more deeper and much more complicated than that. Now, some of these numbers are going to be a little hard to see because the yellow font doesn't show up. but. If in Canada, 48% of our workforce is female, and less than half a percent of those women hold senior management roles. And I think if you look at this over the last 15 years, um, the percent of, of senior management in women has gone up only marginally, like from 14 to 18%. And, and I suppose that's part of the problem, is, is it's still a problem. Even though we've talked about it, uh, we think about it, we write about it, the impact is minimal. 
And, and so what do we do about this? And if you think about it in the biotech area, because obviously most of us are connected from a um, healthcare point of view, um, in Europe, I think 60% of the boardrooms are 100% are men, and in the US, that's 50%. Um, and if you break that down a little bit, uh, there's a group, Lifestream, from the UK did probably one of the most extensive gender diversity studies. They're a recruitment firm. Um, and they, they really looked into this. There's some really interesting data from the study that they recently published, 2014. Um, in Germany and, and the Netherlands, uh, you'll see the lowest proportion of women in boardrooms, about 4%. Um, compared to something like Scandinavia, about 16%, and in France, 17%. So these numbers are really low. Now, if you look at the management teams, it looks better, but not much better. And so you have to ask yourself, well, why, why is this happening, even today? And I think it's, it's general practice that we're getting into, and, and particularly when you think about senior roles, whether that's management teams or board directors. The talent pool that we're trying to pull from is too small. Um, it's it's not. It's just a, it just has simply a low proportion of women, and therefore women are not getting selected for these positions. And sadly, a lot of women are turning down these opportunities. So, what what is it that we are doing? that's causing this. And it's got a lot to do with just the basic structure of how we're recruiting for these, these particular jobs. And I think the other piece that we need to think about is what, what is being termed these days as um, unconscious bias. And th this is something that I think it, it's not specific to men, certainly not. It's got a lot to do with women. I mean, myself or anybody else, it's remarkable when you really put yourself in a position asking yourself if you really are addressing these questions, are you doing what you need to do? And, and I think the simple answer is no. I think, and that's why, of course, it comes down to being unconscious. So, some of these, these are phraseologies that come up quite a bit as it relates to what we're dealing with when we think about how we get more women into more senior management roles, frankly, regardless of the sector that you're thinking about. Second shift is a principle where fundamentally it's the, it's the roles that we're choosing. We're choosing part-time, um, and we're doing this largely because we still are the main caregivers. I mean, when you think, oops, oh, that's nice. Um, when you think of John's question, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me is my children. Um, that's probably a different perspective than necessarily others in the room. Um, the mummy penalty, this is kind of a horrible uh, way of putting it, but um, it comes down to that we're, to, you know, we're not as promoted, uh, we have lower starting salaries. Um, interestingly, uh, when you think about women's salaries, Having children have actually increased the salary by men by 6%, whereas for women, it's decreased the salary by 4%. Which is kind of a curious thing, but if you think about it, maybe that makes a lot of sense by the way we look at this. And another term we hear a lot about is the pink ghetto. And, and essentially what that means is the clustering of women around particular fields. Um, social sciences, public administration, education, and not enough in things like architecture, um, engineering, technology, where essentially women are making up about 9% of these higher paying jobs. So um, the, these are principles that are still with us today that we need to concern ourselves about. And we are different. I mean, we need to... Um, we need to celebrate those differences, and frankly, there's enough data out there to suggest we need to do more than that. We actually need to exploit it, but we need to do it with the right kind of view. Um, so we tend to look at male versus women through different lenses, and this is part of this unconscious bias. And one of the examples that gets used fair amount when a woman negotiates a salary um, somehow from a, uh, I should say, when a person negotiates a salary, if it's a man, it's seen as, you know, being 
showing leadership and thinking hard about what they need versus a woman, it's more of an abrasive, you know, tough kind of approach, which when you think about it, that doesn't make sense at all. So it's, it's trying to look at, look at the situation without these biases. And this was a, um, a cartoon that really caught my attention. I think it's a fabulous visualization. Sorry, I mean, some people may find this rather offensive, but um, this was an article writ written by a woman by the name of Julia Bard. It was in the New York Times, and this was uh, put in context of mansplaining. You know, just this sort of overwhelming feeling of words. And, and that obviously is something that's happening, um, but I think from a woman's point of view is why are we letting this? You know, why are we not speaking up? Why are we not participating in the way that we really need to do? So what, what do we do about this? And I think a lot of the onus comes down to, you know, CEOs, uh, chairs of the organization to essentially um, lead the charge to promote diversity. Uh, from a recruiter's point of view, you need to think about uh, how are you setting up your pool to try and connect the company with the individual that you want to select. And I, and I think the other group that's fundamental, particularly if you think about it from the investment point of view, is the venture, community, the venture capital community. The VCs, as you well know, have a remarkable influence on the hiring of management teams in biotech. And in that group alone, about 9% of that workforce is made up of, of women. Uh, corporate venture is better, it's about double that. But the point is, you've got a very small group of individuals that might be advocating for a woman, and so you don't see that kind of leadership selection in biotech. So it's part of the issue. And I think we would all do well if we could take some of this unbiased training because it's the way we're going to become much more aware of what we're up against. But I, I guess I, it's not my point to focus on the negative about this, but I think the point is that we are, it is a daunting situation without a doubt, but certainly speaking at it from uh, a woman's point of view, I, I don't want to be defined only by my gender. I don't want to be here because I'm a woman. I want to be here because I'm competent, I'm capable, I've had a good career, uh, I deserve to have the opportunities that anybody else would. And so when I'm asked to talk with women, because often that's, you know, we get asked to do a fair amount of mentoring, um, it's really about providing them with opportunities to consider choices and to um, not, them, not let them get demotivated by some of the challenges. Because if you think about, I think a lot of people are interested in a venture capital career, but really, um, because of the culture, it's not something you gravitate to because it's, it's almost like an overwhelming force of um, challenge to see how well you could do in an atmosphere like that. So if you think about it from an entrepreneur's point of view, you know, we're always encountering obstacles and it's really about what do you, what do, you do about those obstacles? How do you, how do you overcome it? What, what is it that you're going to try and do that's different so you don't run into these troubles? Because at the end of the day, um, there, are, there are limitless possibilities. And it's so, certainly something that um, I want to encourage anybody in the room that is feeling somewhat um, put off by some of the paths that they might take. And, and I think another element to this is there is certainly enough evidence out there that by having a diverse set of skills, including including the thoughts behind gender, is your bottom line is going to be better. Um, there is a study done by the Peterson Institute for International Economics and another one by Credit Suisse in 2012. And they did extensive studies to look at this. And both came out with the same outcome, that your profit margin is, is improved uh, by having more women involved. But the thing was, it wasn't just uh, a token woman, because unfortunately we do fall prey to that, where you have that one single board member that's supposed to take care of all of these issues. But really, from a truly competitive point of view, you want you want a ratio that actually is meaningful. 
Um, and so that's something I think we should all be striving for because at the end of the day, you know, um, you want to build on successes of others. And I think for women, we need to take much more advantage of the mentorship programs that are available. Men are very good at this. They tend to gravitate to these kinds of programs, whereas unfortunately, women don't. And so as I mentioned earlier, you know, from my point of view, um, it's not about gender, it's really about seeking balance. You know, there is enough evidence out there to suggest that we will all do better for that. So what are we going to do about it? How are we going to um, get us to a place where we can think about this? And I, I don't know how many of you, um, at J.P. Morgan last, last year, that's in January, that's held in San Francisco, uh, this is a meeting of our um, investor community, biotech, uh, large pharma, single biggest meeting that we have every year. And um, there was a uh, reception held, uh, Life Science Advisors, their uh, investment bank. And um, the thing that came out a couple of weeks after that, that party was that um, they were very, the, the organizers were very concerned that there was going to be like a nine to one ratio of, of uh, men to women and something that wasn't going to be seen as terribly fun. So they hired models. <laughs> yep. In this day and age, they hired models. Apparently, they were scantily clad. And um, it just, it blew up in their faces, absolutely blew up in their faces. Um, uh, for people who know BioCentury, Karen Bernstein, uh, Kate Bingham from um, a venture firm in the UK, so they wrote a letter, uh, an open letter, and it went viral. Where basically the call to question is practice, like why, why would you have to do that today? And it's, it totally backfired. It, it has generated an unbelievable number of stories as a result of that. And what's interesting is the fellow, at first, the, the investment bank you know, pushed back and said, they tried to explain it, losing battle. And now he's become an evangelist. You know, he's now out there, he's changing programs, God knows what's gonna happen. Now, it's a little unfortunate that it comes from that, but it's very interesting that that's, what's that, 2015. Uh, that we go through this kind of metamorphosis. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting situation that we have. So, um, but I also, I also think that, uh, again, certainly from a woman's point of view, you don't want to be using any of this as an excuse. Um, it, as an entrepreneur and as a leader, you really want to be setting an example. Uh, I think it's extremely important for all of us uh, in senior management positions that we, that we are role models, whether it's man or woman, uh, as far as um, encouraging um, a diversity of, of skills at the table. And I think from a woman's point of view, to get away from this self-limiting way in which we look at things. Um, you know, when I talked about several reasons why we're seeing less women uh, in these management roles, um, we ourselves are backing out. It's like that scenario with the venture capital community. You know, we're choosing not to take that path because of some of those cultural challenges. Well, we just have to move forward and, and believe we can do what we need to do and work with people. Um, these are just some of the things. I mean, there's, there's like quote after quote after quote that you can go for, but um, I, guess, I guess for me, again, looking at this, it's really, you know, uh, we have so many obstacles as an entrepreneur, and in this whole world of biotech, when we're dealing with starting a company, raising money, particularly in drug development, we have so many hurdles to get over. It's such a difficult task. The being a woman is just one other, one other obstacle. And um, if, you, if you think about how you're going to succeed in something like this, it's... Um, it's really up to the individual. I love this. I wish that was me, but I could have said 20 years ago that might be me. But it is, it is for all of us to own the responsibility of um, some of the challenges that we're up against. Um, so let me, let me tell you a little bit about my latest challenge. And, and this is really, um, 
uh, an interesting story. Uh, so if you think about my career, I've spent a fair amount of time uh, in the life sciences uh, from an early stage point of view, whether it's running a biotech or um, from a translational center, and now an accelerator. So Accelerex is this health sciences accelerator in Canada. It's a national entity. Um, and what we're interested in doing is supporting the ability for more companies to be growing in Canada. Similar to what I think was experienced in Europe, we saw a real uh, decrease in the amount of venture capital in our country. And uh, we had to figure out new ways in which to ensure that we could have more companies being created. So still lots of discoveries coming out of the universities, but were they getting adequately funded? Um, and this is a big problem in Canada because you just don't have the money that you need to have. So um, what we thought would be a good idea was to create an entity that could focus from a seed perspective and provide two main things, capital and talent, because those really two are the single hardest things to ensure that you have to make sure you have a successful company. Um, so, so we created Accelerex, and it's um, essentially to allow us to see smaller companies grow into anchor companies. Because I think we would all agree that at the end of the day, to have a healthy cluster, you really have to make sure that you have companies growing in your country. Now, they're all going to, we face the issue of those being sold or not. Um, mm -hmm. But if you can see enough growth in your country and capture some of that value, you've done something that's worthwhile. So what we're doing uh, is we are working with a number of these centers of excellence in Canada. It was a federal program that got created in uh, 2008. And it was an interesting policy initiative by the federal government who wanted to see uh, greater success in commercializing early stage technology into um, successful investment opportunity. So a number of business models emerged and many came out of the health sector because from, from a Canadian point of view we have some great science that we can take advantage of. And so these CESAs were created um, and I was part of uh, the organization Center for Drug Research and Development. We have Rafi Hofstein in the audience who was with Mars Innovation, and we were part of that first cohort of these translational centers, which I think from a Canadian perspective have emerged as being some of the more um, interesting business models that have risen to try and address that commercialization gap between early stage and, and the investment opportunity. So the idea for Accelerex was to build on that. These centers were there to create really interesting companies, what we wanted to do was get them suitably ready for Series A, so we would act as that resource that would support the companies coming out of these individual Caesars and, and seeing greater success out of that. So we've, we've really just started building this model. It's been um, in this last year, and so we hope that it will start to have an impact over, over time, um, where we, because of the ability of building on all the incubation that's coming through with these originating centers, um, then we'll start to see stronger companies getting funded, better Series A arising, and um, supporting the opportunities that we have in Canada. And I think if, if we're right by this, um, some of the biggest challenges you have when you're transferring technology out of the universities is these are not adequately validated technologies. Um, we made some big mistakes, you know, in the 90s, um, where a lot of technology came out of universities not adequately funded, certainly not validated. Um, this even carried on into the 2000, where we had way more venture capital being thrown at early stage companies. Unfortunately, with technologies not being properly validated, a lot of these companies tanked. When you think about that from a funding point of view, from a venture point of view, if you, if you, we didn't, we didn't get the returns, in other words, from the venture capital. So when you're trying to raise more money for more funds, it's hard to do that if you don't have a track record. So part of the principle with these new business models emerging is translating 
organizations between universities and the investment opportunity is hopefully they'll do the validation, we'll see greater success with the companies, they'll be better funded, and we'll see more of them grow in Canada and, and be successful and do all the employment that's necessary. So that's, that's kind of my story. Um, to end with a great quote from a wonderful artist, they always say, Time changes things, but you actually have to change them yourself. And I think that's really the bottom line, that we all have that responsibility um, to take part in what's necessary to make this a better, um, more bottom line, have more successful companies, frankly. So I thank you very much for your attention.